Okay, welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. So we're going to introduce a new subplot into the story of TASI 2024. Uh, we have here Christoph Weniger from the University of Amsterdam, who's going to be telling you about statistics and machine learning. Take it away. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Um, yes, I, I'm happy to be here. First time at the uh, TASI school, first time here in Boulder. Um, I will talk about statistics and machine learning. And what that specifically means is, uh, during the first lecture, I will talk about, uh, let me get this out, overview. So during the first lecture, I will talk a bit about why we're actually interested in statistical inference. So what statistical, can you hear me? Why? I think the microphone is on. Okay. So what statistical inference is about and why it's relevant and um, statistics. And I will also try to introduce um, multilayer perceptrons, so the, the most minimal building blocks of, of deep learning. Um, so you will learn a bit about Bayesian statistics mostly and a bit about deep learning. Then the second lecture tomorrow will be about variation and inference, uh, which is one of the ways to use deep learning for solving statistics problems. And then on Thursday and, and Friday, I will talk about simulation-based inference. <laughs> in, uh, and four as well. And as you have seen, there are some tutorial sessions. So also the one today, the lecture today was, I think, listed as tutorial. Today, today is not a tutorial. But we will have tutorials on the other three days. So I, I uh, would like to ask you to bring your laptops. Uh, there will be Google Colab notebooks, uh, which you can all run on your laptop. And you can directly uh, try out some of the, or all of the techniques that we will discuss here. So this will include uh, training neural networks and, and playing a bit around with that and trying to, to solve statistics problems in that way. Um, good, so the main points today will be inference matters and how it matters, and then that um, model realism, when, when you think about your mod models that you want to compare with data, can actually be one of the problems uh, when running inference tasks. And um, yeah, so we'll get to it. Um, yes. Good. So first, First thing is statistical inference. Um, yeah, it's, okay. I, I'll try try to get it here. So, so let me first start to talk about the inverse problem. So to, to gauge like what, what I should talk about and not, I, I would like to ask you a few questions. Who, who has uh, trained a neural network before? Raise your hand. Okay. Who knows what Bayes' theorem is? Who knows what conditional, marginal, and joint probability distributions are? Okay, so you know statistics to a large extent. Um, what else could I ask? Um, yeah, I think this gives me like a rough idea. So, so I will keep the initial part brief, and, and then, so who knows what a multilayer perceptron is? Who doesn't know what a multilayer perceptron is? Okay, so I, we keep that. Who know? Who has heard about logistic regression? Okay, so, so it's a difficult. It's just like fifty percent will know what I talk about, and the other. So the first lecture is for the other fifty percent. Uh, <laughs> But, but with some interesting twists, hopefully. Um, good. So the inverse problem. The inverse problem is basically the following. So we we usually have a model, right, that we would like to compare to data. So models, theoretical models, suggest uh, taking specific pieces of data by looking at the sky or building a collider, um, and then we have to run analysis. Uh, where we compare predicted results with actually observed results. So the observations, I write them here as a vector x, maybe some piece of data that we observed, and then we have a model m that has some parameters z typically, um, which makes predictions for our observations, 
And somehow we would like to compare these predictions with the actual observations and then draw conclusions about the model that we are interested in. Um, and that's in the process called statistical inference. Um, if, if we are in the simple situation where M would be deterministic, um, we would just have a model that makes one prediction based on some inputs, right? And then the only thing that we would have to do is to, to invert that model if it's invertible and we get our result. Um, so that might look like we have here data X and parameter Z. And if there would be a very simple relationship, an invertible relationship, and this would be our observation, then we could tell immediately, okay, this here is our best fit parameter. Good, in reality, our models are typically stochastic. Um, so let me put this here. So in reality, we will have stochastic models, not the least because we have me measurement noise, which means that typically we don't get, if we run our simulation model, one answer, but we get a whole series of answers, uh, which are described by some probability distribution. So we can also write this as uh, X drawn from some underlying distribution, which will depend on the model parameters in MM. I, I will give some concrete examples in a second. And so what we then want to do, uh, the situation is then typically, okay, for a given parameter, we might actually get a range of predictions, right? So which are distributed along this axis. And so for a given observation, we are then interested in figuring out, okay, what's a plausible range of parameters that is consistent with, with my observation. And one can write this, for instance, it's a typical thing that one then does is to define intervals. So for a specific observation, our measurement result would be then the set of all parameters from our parameter space, which I call your omega, where in some sense the output of our model is and I stay here very awake, often close to what we observed, okay? And this here comes, the intervals like this typically come with a failure tolerance. So failure. Um, which basically says something about how often the However, we define a true parameter Z, which actually was underlying our experiment is not included in, in the interval. Okay, so now what precisely often close to means um, depends on whether you are a frequentist or a Bayesian, because they have different approaches to this. Both make sense in their own way and both have shortcomings. Um, and I will briefly talk about this and then mostly stick to, to Bayesian uh, inference throughout the lectures. But before I go there, I wanted to introduce some basic statistical concepts um, because that's, that's necessary. Um, yeah? Uh, okay, so typically this would be your failure to tolerance. Um, this would be basically the failure to include the true parameter in the interval. So if you run an experiment, there might be a true set of parameters that describe that were underlying the data generation process. Then afterwards, based on the data, you generate an interval. And it can be that the interval is here in the end and not actually includes your true parameter. So alpha determines how often this, this is allowed to happen. So and typically you would set up then 68% or the 90, one minus alpha might be 68% or 95% and so on, and this could be either credible intervals when you're Bayesian or confidence intervals when you're frequentist. I will define this in a uh, second. No, I, I will define alpha a bit more uh, precisely later on. Alpha really says something about the rate, the failure rate, basically. If you want to have a failure rate of zero, uh, typically 
so you wouldn't end up with a 100% credible interval or a confidence interval, which might just cover the entire parameter space, then you can't fail. Okay, but before we can't, can talk about that, we need a bit of basic, uh, ba basic statistics, and I suspect for many of you this will be not very new information. So, um, good. So if he, statistics is about describing random variables, right? So let's suppose we have a random variable which lives in some state space omega. Um, then we can have a probability distribution that describes the distribution of this variable. Um, and that probability distribution usually is, or has to be larger than uh, non-zero, oh, sorry, non-negative. Uh, and we can also, and what we can, can do with this is we can calculate, and this is what we will typically do, expectation values. And I'm mostly writing this here up to fix notation. So for instance, an expectation value of some quantity f, uh, which might be the parameter itself, then you calculate the mean value, or it might be the square, or, or something else. Th this is defined either by solving an integral, if you have continuous parameters. So we would have to solve this integral. Or if you have a discrete parameter space, we end up with uh, sums over the elements of the parameter space. And uh, probability densities are normalized to one, which essentially means if we calculate the expectation value of, um, in this notation, if we calculate the expectation value of one, we would get one. Okay, so if you, if you integrate over this thing, it would just return a one. If you sum over all possible probabilities, we would get a one. I'm emphasizing this because this will be later on one of the relevant constraints when building machine learning algorithms to actually solve statistics problems. Good, so this is uh, how to calculate expectation values. And then to joint marginal and conditionals. Um, so for this, I would like to just start with an example. So let's suppose we have a probability distribution function for two variables. One is called W, the other is T. And W happens to have two possible values. It's weather, and this can be either rainy or sunny. And temperature, which can be either cold or warm, or cold or warm. So these are the four possible combinations. Then we can assign probabilities to all these um, possible outcomes. This sums to one, as it should. So that's our probability table. Um, good, so now what, what, this is a joint distribution. It's joint for these two parameters. And so now we, we can ask a few questions. For instance, what's the probability that it rains? So what's the probability that it rains in the setup? This is a marginal distribution. You, you can just shout, yeah? 0.5. It's 0 0.5, right? So I, I think. So here you take these two rows, right? You sum them, that, that's like 0 0.5. Um, so then, and, and you obtain, formally you obtain this marginal probability distribution by taking this distribution and just summing over all possible values of t. Then the same, if, I mean, you could also look at the probability that the temperature is cold. Then we would get 0 0.4, right? Now, I mean, this is pretty simple. Now, what's the probability that the weather rains in the case we know it's cold? So this is a marginal, uh, sorry, a conditional distribution. So we are interested in the distribution of weather, the variable weather, knowing that the temperature is, is cold. What would be the outcome? I, I didn't understand any. 0.75, I, I looked at, so let me check, I don't, I haven't. <laughs> I, I think I, either it's that or it was one over four. But uh, I will just have to look at the table. 
So temperature, cold, weather, war. What, what am I doing wrong? Uh, yeah, it's 0.75, right? So if the temperature is cold, you just like ignore this and this row. Uh, you end up with these two numbers and you normalize them to one. So you multiply them or you divide them essentially by 0 0.4 and you end up with uh, three quarters, right? Um, good, so the formal definition of, of the joint distribution of marginal distribution for one random variable would be, for instance, if you sum over the other, right? And if you're interested in conditional distributions, you would take the marginal distrib uh, the joint distribution and divide by the by the marginal. Uh, so this this is this effect of normalizing to one. Okay, you can convince yourself that this here is normalized to one by simply uh, summing over all values of x. Then this here turns into the marginal distribution, and you get a one. Okay, so th this is really all you need to know about statistics. So, uh, so it's uh, conditional distributions over and over again. Okay, good. So I start, and I continue here. Okay, let me check. Good, so now let's look at a simple statistical inference problem. And for fun, let's, let's make up a toy example, a physics toy example of like we have a cannon that throws a ball like this, different initial velocities. We measure the distance and we want from that distance, uh, which we measure with some uncertainty, estimate what was the initial velocity. Now, for that, it's useful to know that the distance is related to the initial velocity via some equation. The main point is here that d depends on the velocity square. So the underlying problem that we have to solve here is actually something like we measure x. x depends on some variable z square. So that's our velocity parameter. x is the distance parameter. And there will be some measurement noise epsilon which let's say is just drawn from a normal, standard normal distribution. So we forget here about all units because they, they don't matter really. So the epsilon is just standard normal distribution that is squared and then we have x as the distance. So now what we can do is we can look, um, I do this over there. Uh, we can look at the joint distribution. Of P of a and X, of, of X and Z, sorry. Uh, which has one component, which will be our likelihood function and one component, which will be uh, our prior. So this is, this is now the distribution of initial velocities that we have. So, sorry, I, Z is velocity here. And so for any given velocity, we can calculate how uh, far the ball was flying and then just add a error of the size epsilon. And this here gives then the distribution of the measured parameters. If you do this, we can in principle run our simulator many times. So we can assume, okay, the initial velocity was somewhere here. Um, but this here is like the noise-free line. And then our measurements might be somewhere across this line, right? So it's basically what I was showing before, but with a more concrete example. Now we could have observed this value here, and we are interested in generating um, an interval based on that. So what we will do is um, we, if we are Bayesian, we will look at the distribution of 
um, points that we see that are consistent with our observation. So again, we were running the simulator here by simply throwing a lot of balls with different initial velocities drawn from some initial distribution and simulating then what we measured by simulating the trajectory as well as the noise. This is the distribution of outcomes that we have in this parameter observational plan, plane. And then we look at the distribution of points along this axis. This is precisely what is a um, conditional probability distribution, right? So this is the joint distribution. If you just read off the distribution of Z given X, it's a marginal distribution. And so if you solve an inference task in this context, this would be the distribution of X given our observed parameter, uh, which we can calculate as the joint distribution divided by the marginal. And then this here is simply um, given by the likelihood function of the observation, given the parameter z, the prior of the parameter z, and the Bayesian evidence. And most of uh, all of you who have seen Bayes' theorem before will recognize this here as, as Bayes' theorem. Okay. So if you if you forget about the central part, um, good. If we if we know that we can. What we can do is we can um, draw the distributions. So we can draw distribution for the initial distribution of velocities. That might be this, uh, this prior distribution here. We can draw the distribution. Um, so let's suppose our measurement errors are a bit larger. So we can also draw the distribution of a possible um, the distribution of or how the likelihood function changes as we change the parameter z. So this will maybe look like this here. So, um, if we change the parameter z, then the um, as you can see here, the probability of observing this value becomes pretty small. Uh, specific observation becomes pretty small, so it goes down here goes down here, it peaks somewhere here in the central region. And then we can simply use Bayes' theorem to calculate um, the posterior, which might be, which be, be a bit direct in that direction because we multiply with the prior. So the posterior might look like this. Okay, so now we still have not, not an interval, but what we can next do is we define now a region here of the posterior such that if we integrate over it, so let's call this theta, one minus alpha, x. If we integrate over that region, um, dz, x, one minus alpha, we get precisely one minus alpha, okay? Um, and this is now our region. So that's the region that I mentioned earlier as the result of our inference strategy. If we are Bayesians, this, this would be our approach. There are now different ways of defining the region. You can move it a bit to the left. You can move it a bit to the right. But this would be a region um, that has a predefined error rate. And um, the logic goes here. So the specific rate that, we are, that I'm talking about here is the following. So imagine you run the simulator or run many possible realizations of this experiment, and then you just look at those realizations where you had the outcome that you actually observed. And then you get a distribution for Z parameters, for possible Z parameters, and this distribution will fail to include the true parameter that led to the observation only in uh, alpha, because only, yeah, in, uh, in a fraction of alpha cases, you will actually have a value of z that led to this parameter that was lying outside of this region, okay? So the region might look like this. Questions about that? Yeah. There was an epsilon. Um, epsilon has to do with, um, Okay, so let, let me write this here concretely. So this here would be the likelihood function. 
this here would be a normal distribution because epsilon is normal distributed um, around the actually predicted value for the distance. So this here is the model where you plug in the velocity and you get out the actual distance that the ball was flying. So this is this corresponds to d as function of the initial velocity. And then, so this would be the mean value, and then sigma would be just one. So this is our measurement error. And this is the shape of the normal distribution that you also see here. So this normal distribution that you see here uh, is, is derived, or the, the shape that you see here for the likelihood function is derived like this. Um, the distribution of, you mean for a fixed value of, of z? Ah, okay, good. That's, this is obtained as it was before when you do marginal, uh, when, when you look uh, at conditionals by simply summing over the parameters. So we have, um, We have the joint distribution, which is given by the data distribution given the parameter time the, times the distribution of the parameters. And we simply have to now um, sum over all possible parameters. Actually, here we would have to integrate. And that's one of the, can be one of the challenges. Often you can't actually do this integral explicitly. Then you end up blowing the posterior only up to a normalizing factor. More questions? So all the, of the rest of what I talk about during the next many hours will be just solving this problem in more, more complicated settings uh, with machine learning. Good. So you, you see this here is, this was now a Bayesian setup. What's fun is that in many ways very related to, I mean, I guess you most, mostly are particle physicists, right? Theoretical particle physicists. Particle physicists like frequentism much more than Bayesianism in many ways. Um, but there's a relation that is, that, that brings both pretty close if one, if one looks at uh, these coverage properties. And I just wanted to write this up. So what we, what we just defined as a Bayesian credible region. Um, so that's a region that has a specific failure rate alpha and is, if, is a function of the observed data. And the property of these regions is that if we um, average now over many possible parameters that could have led to the observation that we actually see, then this region is supposed to contain the underlying parameter that we get in this way. Here, here we sample it literally just from the posterior. Uh, is supposed to contain that parameter in one minus alpha of the cases, okay? And this is a complicated way to write down this integral. If you just replace here the expectation value with its definition in terms of an integral, you end up here. What I included here is an indicator function, this one, um, which I will use quite often. That's just something that is defined such that it is one when x is true and zero when x is false. Okay, so in this way one can write conditions here inside one. So we basically just average over uh, or calculate the fraction of this in the random draws from the posterior for some given observation I actually included in, in the interval that we just constructed. This is one minus alpha, and that's for all, and this is supposed to be the case for all possible observations if you are Bayesian. And it happens kind of by construction. If you just apply Bayes' theorem, get the posterior, and then generate an interval like this, this property is automatically fulfilled. Now, if you are a frequentist, you do something very similar. 
except that you swap x and uh, x and z. So instead of averaging here over all possible parameters that could have led to specific observation, we advert here over all possible observations that can be a consequence of a specific parameter and are interested in how often that parameter is coming. Interval. And we say we want also to be this the case in one minus alpha percent of the cases. And now we want this to be the case for all possible parameters. So that's, that's just the frequentist coverage condition if you want to build frequentist um, confidence intervals. So you see, the, 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 if, if one thinks not about priors and posteriors, but just about intervals that you construct in these two cases, there's a pretty tight connection or duality or something of that uh, sort. Um, so in, in, in the end, Bayesians and frequentists, or at least the methods, uh, differ simply in the way you calculate the error rates, if you condition on data or if you condition on parameters. Good. Um, so next thing I want to talk about is why this all can become actually quite complicated. So now, now it looked reasonably simple, right? So you have a physical model. You um, have a model for how your measurement loss looks like. You write down the likelihood function. You multiply it with some prior. You get the posterior, build your interval. So you could be happy. Uh, it turns out that in practice, these things can become um, quite complicated and challenging. And I want to demonstrate this uh, looking at another simple example, um, which is the Galton board. Who has heard about the Galton board? Well, the, okay, and if I start drawing it, probably many. Uh, so the hidden costs of hidden parameters. Um, so let, let's look at a very simple, another very simple model, Galton board. Um, it's apparently something that was introduced in the 1870s. So the, the idea is simple. Um, let's suppose we have a bunch of pins like this here. And uh, let me draw this correctly. And the construction like this. So we can throw in balls from the, bot, uh, from the top. OK. And they bounce between these pins and end up somewhere in the bottom. And in principle, we can repeat this many times. Then if one has a larger Galton board, one ends up with a normal distribution. That's not the main point I want to make here. What I want to emphasize is, okay, for now we can just treat this as a simple statistical model, um, which is tractable. So we, and we can, define, um, we can uh, define these individual paths simply by uh, listing the numbers uh, where they cross, uh, where the paths pass across the pins. So we have one row of pins here, another row of pins, and another row of pins four rows of pins. And then, for instance, this trajectory A here uh, would here cross the first pin, position zero, then the second pin at position one, here still one, and here still one. So this here would be the first path, and it wouldn't end up in bin zero. And then path B, for instance, would be one, so this here would be position one, one, two, two. And let's say things like um, zero, zero, two, three are forbidden, okay? So the ball can't ju jump over two pins. So this here is a pretty simple model, or a pr pretty simple scenario. And we could now um, try to solve it by, um, and, and solve inference problems with it, like, um, like I will show in a second, by defining first a probabilistic model. So we write 
the model for a given path, which will have all these uh, four numbers defined, and maybe some bias parameter. Uh, B is the probability that the ball jumps uh, when hitting a pin to the right. So we can write this uh, probability for a specific path then as 1 minus B to the power of 4 minus Z4 uh, and B to the power of Z4. Okay, so in the end, the probability for a specific path just depends on where the ball ends up simply because um, to end up in a position, position, specific position, it has to jump a specific number of times to the left and to the right. It doesn't matter in which order. And we multiply this with the indicator function for uh, legal paths. So we only allow here paths that actually don't have this property. Okay, so that's a, that's a reasonably simple model. And the reason why it's simple is because this, this actually still allows um, analytic solutions. And I just write down one solution. So for instance, we could be interested now in calculating um, the probability that given the, that the ball ends up in position three here, uh, what we could calculate, what's the probability that it crossed uh, Z1 in this position rather than that position, right? So we could be interested, for instance, in the first crossing probability. So probability that it went through uh, row one at position zero, given that, that we see it in a specific position, Z4 divided by that it went through position one. Okay? So that, that's kind of a very cheap version of model comparison. We have two models. One is, okay, the ball was thrown here in position B, A. The other is it, was, uh, it felt into our machine at position B. And given what I observe in the last row, I would like to say something about the probabilities of what initially happened. It turns out that one actually can calculate this very easily, and the result is just 4 minus Z4 divided by Z4. So it's kind of clear if it ends up at position 4, it can't have it start, started at position A, and vice versa, and otherwise that's the probability here. And the reason one can calculate this is, or what one has to do to calculate this, is however these marginal probabilities, or the, these uh, conditional probabilities. So what you see here is the probability of Z1 given uh, Z4. Okay, this is what I have written down here. And in order to do that, we actually have to sum over everything else that we don't care about. So we have to, formally, the definition of this is it's a sum over Z2 and Z3 and also an integral over all the biases of our probability distribution divided by um, the same thing, but also summed over Z1 and integrated over all biases. And the nice thing is, in, in this concrete example, we can still do this analytically because it turns out that one can write um, uh, this, this here, so Z1 comma Z4. So the joint distribution simply has a product of binomial distributions and Bernoulli distributions, so very concrete distributions, and then it turns out to be very simple because we don't actually have to count all the paths and all, to, all the, the possibilities. We can just use analytical tricks. But the problem is now if we, the problem is if we now make the model slightly more realistic, um, yeah. and there are other things one could calculate. you find this in the lecture notes. But I don't have time for that. So if I now increases model realism, right? By let's say instead of having four layers, we have 30 layers, which would be a large Galton board, but the ones that I found on the internet have 25 or something, so that's not completely outrageous. And then let's say that the bias that we have is small, but it's not uniform. I mean, why should it be uniform? So it's like you have one bias parameter close to one half, but for each pin, so pin-dependent bias. 
and then this model suddenly turns into something very difficult. So you have like around 450 bias parameters. And if you just think about the path, number of paths that connect the top to the bottom central bin, this is pretty large. This is like around 100 million paths just because of combinatorics. And since you can't play many analytical tricks then anymore for summing all the bias parameters because they are all different, you actually you would have to solve something like this. So just gigantic sums over and over again. And so what this means is that suddenly, although this is not an outrageously like unrealistic model, exact inference uh, becomes intractable. And the word intractable uh, essentially means it becomes practically impossible to, to calculate this. Um, and if one wants to boil it down in, in a very simple way, there, there are typically, if, an, if you encounter situations like this in real life where you have to analyze data and you have a model and you want to fit it to the data, you use some statistic machinery, but you run against the problem that it takes too, too long to actually get a result because you have to sum too many things or run to your Markov chain too long. Either you keep your model simple but then it might be too simple, right, to actually describe data and then you end up with getting biased wrong results or to do um, approximate inference. And um, approximate inference by its name is something that wouldn't allow you nice analytical solutions like this type here, um, but sometimes dirty solutions with error bars and uncertainties um, attached to them. But on the flip side, on the other side, you can make your model complex and more realistic. And that's, um, that's where deep learning can come in. There are many approximate inference methods. Also Markov chain Monte Carlos maybe fall, fall under that category. Um, but I would here mostly focus on deep learning related methods. Um, mostly because like the best approximators that we maybe have today are deep neural networks in many ways, um, in, in many situations. Good. So I spent now more time than expected with the statistics part, but I wanted to still introduce deep learning now. There's still half an hour left. But before I go there, are there questions about this? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by bias? Uh, but with bias, I simply meant this parameter B, which yeah, sorry, I should have written this down. So the probability, uh, I put this here. So probability uh, is B. And to jump left is one minus B. And then these pin-dependent biases are just parameter, bias parameters for each bin. Here we assume that each time the ball hits a specific bin, the probability will be the same B. Like maybe you tilted the Galton Borkins in some way. More, more questions? Okay, so what, what you ideally should take away from this is some basic idea of how one solves statistics problems with by, by using over and over again the concept of conditional probabilities. And then the fact that it's really nice to have analytic solutions to problems, but often this forces us to actually make the model simpler than it actually is. And um, yeah, it's interesting to explore alternative approximate methods to solve statistics uh, or inference tasks. Good, so now uh, in the next 30 minutes, I will give you a, a crash course in deep learning. <laughs>
and um, so deep learning. And I, I think we should be able to get through because many of the, I mean, most of these topics will just come over and over again during the next days. So, so we will be able to, to repeat some of the material. Good. So let me start with like some, some prehistory in some sense. So. The first networks that maybe can, can be called neural, artificial neural networks were perceptron models, maybe in the 1940s or something. Um, and they were inspired by, by a single neuron or combining single neurons where the idea is that you have some output that can be either zero or one. So that's like a firing neuron or non-firing neuron and a combination of inputs. And the input values determine if, if the neuron fires or not. And in the simplest, one very simple model that one can then write to model this is we take the, the heavy side step function. So if, if the inputs are positive, it returns a one. If the input, inputs are negative, it, it returns a zero. So properties in that respect. And then we just introduce um, a weight vector, which in this case would have a dimensionality of four, and a bias parameter. So we have a five parameter model. And we try to do interesting things with it. So one interesting things, uh, thing that one could do is now uh, classify inputs. So let's suppose we just have two inputs, x2 and x1, and we have two types of data. So this here will be T1. Uh, this will be examples for T1. And this here will be examples for uh, T0. Then this model could tell us or give us a decision, sur uh, decision surface, which would be just defined by W. So weight vector times x equals minus b, right? So this is this decision surface. And then if we plug in some param x, y, uh, x parameter on that side of the decision surface, the model would return y equals 1. Otherwise, it would return y equals 0. So that, that's a simple model that one can build. One can then have training data, which would be a list of uh, example inputs and desired outputs um, and try to minimize the loss function that counts the number of missed cl classifications. So the loss function would be in this case just the sum over our training examples and we compare the desired output Ti with the model output if we plug, plug in um, xi. Okay, and then you can square it or not. But, um, but so th this could be a target, and then the perceptron model was actually a hard to implementation of that idea with many neurons, trains uh, on, on in a simple image classification tasks. So this was actually, so you, can, you can look this up online. This was something that existed with a lot of cables and tunable resistors and so on for the input weights. Uh, the problem is that you can't implement this easily in a computer and minimize it because the loss function is non-differentiable. So if you wanted to optimize this, you can calculate the gradient with respect to the weights, but you end up with zeros because of the heavy side step function. So an iteration of this, which goes a bit beyond that, and is in some sense the next step, Um, is what's called a logistic regression model. So basic logistic regression um, 
essentially takes that idea but introduces first the notion of probability, right? Uh, and so notion of probability so that everything on that side of the decision surface isn't necessarily classified as one and everything on that side as zero but there's just a probability that's uh, associated with that things with each specific space here in the parameters or spot in the parameter space that that spot belongs to class t equals zero or t equal one. So there's a notion of probability and then also some more flexibility in terms of defining the decision surface. And so the idea was instead of directly modeling outputs that are zero or one, we try to model the probability um, of the output being one or zero. And the model still has to have some free uh, tunable parameters, which I indicate here as W. And this is now supposed to model a probability distribution function, a conditional probability for uh, T equal one, C being one, given that you are somewhere at a specific spot in your parameter, input parameter space X. And in order to model this, we need something that lives somewhere between zero and one, right? So we want a probability, discrete probability, can be larger than one. And in order to do this, we introduce a function called sigmoid, uh, which happens to just squeeze everything on the real axis between zero and one. And then we have again our weights. And now in, instead of multiplying them with x, which just would have give us this kind of boring linear uh, planes, we multiply it with a nonlinear function of x. So now this uh, phi here can be, for instance, if we have a two dimensional input, it could be something like one, x1, x2, x1 squared, two squared, x1 times x2, right? So th then this function here, the basis function, maps our two dimensional input space actually on 6D and allows to, to model uh, in this case, polynomials of, of uh, second order, right? So that, that's the standard approach uh, for, for logistic regressions. So in this way, you can introduce additional flexibility in how this decision service can look like. So about the sigmoid function, um, so let me first write the probability for returning zero. This would be just sigmoid minus the input And the sigmoid function itself is defined as one over one plus e to the power minus x. So if you draw this, it will simply look like a smoothed heaviside step function. Okay, so that, that's the sigmoid function. And it has the property that sigmoid of, or sigma of x plus sigma of minus x equals one. This is why we can model uh, the probabilities for t equal one and t equal zero in this way. I just changed, changed here the minus sign. Okay. So. Okay, so how does this <clears throat> change our problem now? Where we, let's imagine again, we have uh, training data like this here. So a few blue crosses here, uh, yellow crosses here, and then a few blue crosses here. This corresponds to zero. This corresponds to one. Now, if you train a model like this, and I haven't really said you how to train it, what could happen is that the decision surface now uh, becomes, uh, I mean, a bit more complex. So it has more degrees of freedom to actually adopt to the situation. And furthermore, um, everything on the left isn't automatically classified as one, and everything on the right automatically as zero. But what we see is that simply the probability exactly on the decision surface for t equal one given x will be one half. 
So this here just defines where the probability is 50-50 for both classes. And then on that side, it will be uh, the probability for T equal 1 will be larger and probably approaching 1 if you go far enough. And here, the probability for 0 will be larger uh, and probably approaching 1 if you go far enough. Good, so now that's, that's a more flexible model. And one can say a lot about what basis functions to use, and the results will depend also somewhat on, or can depend a lot on how to, how ba how, um, what, what basis function to use. Uh, but what's more relevant for us here is how to actually train this model now. Um, so. Because the training will be something that um, likelihood. Training will be something that also will be applicable in the end to, to uh, neural networks. Good. So how, how to train a model like this? Well, here for, for the perceptron model, it was reasonable to say, okay, we want to minimize the, fault, um, the misclassification rate. What we can do here in this case, in the context of the logistic regression model, since we have a actually a probabilistic model that looks a little bit like statistics is to, to use also a statistical approach to define a loss function. And uh, what makes a lot of sense is to maximize the likelihood to, to train the model such that the likelihood of the training data becomes maximized under that model. So imagine this is, I mean, this is our training data. Now we can write down the likelihood function for labels t from our training data given input parameters x. And we can here take a product over all, um, over all training data examples. And so now this turns into the joint likelihood of, of all the training labels. And we can try to adjust the weights of our network now, well, of this logistic regression model now such that the model that we train maximizes the probability uh, that you observe what you ob observed in the training data. And since we like to have loss functions, it makes sense to put a minus sign in front. And since products are difficult to deal with, it's also a good idea to take the logarithm of this. So a loss function can be derived by starting with the maximum likelihood principle and then taking minus log of that. And if you do that, one can write this explicitly as now not a product, but sum over all training examples. And yeah, let me just write the full expression. So we have here uh, the training label T and the sigmoid. So this here is trained in label Ti, and this is, the, this is essentially Q for Ti equal one. And then we have here minus, the same minus that you have here, and one minus Ti. So if ti is one, then this term matters. If ti is actually zero, this term matters. And then we have here the probability of t equals zero. So that's the sigmoid. Oh, there's a minus sign missing in the notes. Uh, of minus the weights times the uh, basis functions. So this is now our loss function. And in order to get the maximum likelihood estimator, we simply have to find the weights that minimize that loss. So we would be interested in maximum likelihood estimator, which will be the argmin over all uh, parameters w of this loss function. Good. So. That, that's something that, that we now encountered in the context of, of logistic regression models. 
but the various or very similar things will also happen when we start looking at uh, any deep neural network. So we typically have a loss function often derived by uh, maximum likelihood from or using maximum likelihood principles, and then we are interested in whatever parameters minimize that loss. So what's what now very nice with the logistic regression model is that actually we can calculate gradients now of the loss function with respect to the weights, W. And this loss function has, I call this here Y. So this loss function has um, yeah, let me, let me write it like this. So this loss function has a very simple form, which looks like this. Uh, sorry, the gradient of the loss function is actually a bit simpler than the original uh, function because some of the terms collapse. So what you see here is simply the probability of t equal one compared with whether t is one or not, also with the true t, and then times uh, our basis functions. And we can, in principle, now use this gradient of the loss function in order to uh, find the minimum. Um, good, so this brings me to stochastic gradient descent. But any questions so far? Yeah. Yes. You mean here? Um, okay. More questions? Good. So stochastic gradient descent. Now we now we want to actually uh, minimize that loss. And we know the gradient, which is great. Um, and we can try to do it with um, stochastic gradient descent. Um, first, I will talk about gradient descent, and then why we want to make it stochastic, or why it makes sense to make it already stochastic here. Okay, so we have now the gradient of the loss function, right? And I start calling it g phi, so let's say uh, phi are actually the three parameters of the model that you want to fit. So in the current case, it's just um, the weights, W. And so the gradient is simply defined as the gradient of the loss function, this is G. And we can obtain this, as you can see, by summing over the gradients um, of the uh, individual terms of the loss function. So Li is now just one of the terms that you see here. And, and that's the loss, right? And so now uh, a simple update rule would be, so let, let's suppose a simple example, we just have one parameter. This is our loss function. That might be the surface of our loss function. Now it makes sense to simply start somewhere, right? Let's say here and then use the gradient to go in the right direction. Maybe end up here, and then end up here, and then at some point in the minimum. And a way to do this would be to define an iterative scheme where the next uh, set of weights that, that we have, that we consider simply given by the previous set of weights minus a tiny bit of the gradient, right? So the gradient points in the wrong direction, so we have to subtract the gradient. And in this way, if you do everything right, we come a bit closer to the minimum. 
whether it's the global minimum or a local minimum or whether we overshoot and so on. This depends all on the details, but, but it's a very simple starting point. Now, one question that one could ask um, already here is, okay, what's actually a reasonable value for, for gamma, right? So what's a good learning rate if it's, if it's too large? If you, if you play this game, then you would immediately jump out of, of the minimum region. If you use gamma that is too small, you would go always in very small steps, and it might take a long time until you converge. So it turns out that uh, in practice, it depends very much on, on context, on, on what you are doing. Um, but one can still look at the simple example. So let's suppose the loss function has the form a plus b phi plus c phi square, right? So and c is positive. Then in this example, one could show that an optimal gamma, which would immediately let you jump to the minimum, so that's um, in this case optimal, would be given by uh, 1 over c, square root of, of, of 1 over c. Um, usually when you have a minimization problem like this, you don't actually know, of course, the form, so you can't really calculate second derivative with respect to your weights to use this. Um, so usually you would, the, yeah, minimizing would re require a bit of trial and error. So that's, that's how this in practice tends to be often done. Um, nevertheless, this is a good starting point for the algorithm. The, main difficulty in using it as it is here is to actually calculate the sum. Because if you are in a situation where you might, have, might not have just um, a handful of training examples as, as, as shown there, but maybe 100,000 training uh, examples, or images and so on, calculating that sum and calculating all the gradients can be extremely time consuming. So each of these little steps would take uh, it, yeah, the problem becomes hard to solve simply because each of the update steps would take already a very long time. So one, and at the same time, it's true that maybe many of the points would provide similar information. So it's not clear that you actually need all the training data just to guess roughly in which direction you should update the weights. And so one idea in this context is instead of using the full exact gradient that is based on our training data to use a gradient estimator. And so the idea is, so use gradient estimator. That is not the full gradient, but it's the gradient that we get by just summing over um, a subset of the parameters. So let's suppose we select uh, subset of training examples randomly um, from a list of all indices of our training data. Here, this is the, the number of, of uh, components that we select. And then we sum the loss function only over this mini batch. So it's usually called mini batch. In that case, we get an estimator for the gradient. So it's not the full gradient, but it's a gradient that probably points somewhat in the right direction. And the important point is that on average, if we average over all possible subsets, uh, it actually gives an unbiased estimator. So on average, this gradient that we just generated based on, let's say, 100 rather than 100,000 uh, training examples will point in the right direction. It turns out that in practice this is uh, more than enough to actually make these models converge. And um, yeah, how to do this in practice is often uh, so requires sometimes more advanced algorithms than just stochastic gradient descent. Sometimes it requires also changing the learning rate and the process and so on. So there are a lot of subtleties connected to this. But the basic idea is simply, okay, let's suppose this is a two-dimensional loss surface. So 
phi 1, phi 2, then gradient descent would, when if you start here, typically just follow the gradient. So it might go here, it might go there, it might go here, it might end up in the middle somewhere. But each of these update steps might have taken a very large, a very long time. Whereas stochastic gradient descent would, to a large extent, diffuse around, but eventually settle in the minimum. Um, Good. So that's the idea of stochastic gradient descent, which is usually used for, for training a neural network. At the end, you would typically reduce the learning rate, which would mean uh, that you effectively average when, um, over more gradient evaluations to, to take a next overall large step. Um, there's also a benefit of actually having noise in the system because in the high dimensional problem, there's better chance that you jump out of local minima and reach better minima. Um, so that's using full gradient-based um, optimization would be also not feasible or tractable given large data sets. So that's, that's the approach that one would use. There's a question. Is the stochastic part just the selection of the mini-batch? The stochastic part is the selection of the mini-batch, yes. Yeah. And uh, usually it's also not implemented like this. So the typical implementation would be you just run once to re-enter training data but you might shuffle the order in which you run through this and so on and so forth. But the, the key thing is that many uh, averaging over many mini batches gives you unbiased or gives, gives you back the gradient estimator or the, the correct gradient. More questions. So in principle, I wanted to introduce also multilayer perceptrons, but I will do this tomorrow and also talk about back propagation and so on. So we have time for a few more questions. So for, for, uh, if, if you don't have questions, I have questions for you. So for whom is this new information? So who has seen stochastic gradient descent before? Who has not seen this before? Okay. Um, so you will, so ma many of these things look like, in, in some sense, much of this is very simple ideas, right? Okay, we just minimize a function by using the gradient, right? Could, couldn't be simpler. And then, okay, we can't calculate the full gradient, so we, we use the stochastic approach. So the fact that it actually is a useful thing is usually just shown in practice. There are many other ideas which also look very plausible, but which don't work well in practice. To see that this works in practice, it, it's useful to just try it out in, in, in the tutorials tomorrow. Okay, but questions from you, maybe. So yeah, so Markov J Monte Carlo is the specific method to actually sample effectively from the posterior distribution, right? You, here, here we want to solve a minimization problem. We are not really interested in how these parameters are distributed. We just want to get to the minimum. Markov chain um, Monte Carlo would be very, in it, yeah, would, would not be useful in this case. More questions? Okay, good, then sh should we stop? For, um, so, uh, yeah, thanks. One reminder to bring the laptops tomorrow. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. More about the I mean, yeah, general Bayesian idea, like when you choose the prior, like, do we have a good idea of how to choose the prior? I mean, I guess.